Big day. In a matter of an hour, India will be in poll vault mode. Election Commission is set to declare the dates for the 2024 elections, including the Lok Sabha elections and some of the state assemblies as well. Dates for Arunachal Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, Odisha and Sikkim states like Maharashtra, Haryana and Jharkhand are also expected to vote later this year, but we aren't sure whether these dates also will be announced. The moment the announcement will be made, the model code of conduct will come into effect. And this would mean no new government schemes, announcements, regular inaugurations by the government, no use of government money or any machinery for party work. Though, of course, government's administrative work would continue. And that's why you had the spree of recent inaugurations by Prime Minister Modi and several other ministers as well, linked to key airports, railway stations, universities, even mega infrastructural inaugurations in Mumbai as well. This is something that happens with every government uh, before the elections because obviously the credit war is very crucial to how the perspective is built. 2019 had the highest voter turnout in the history of Indian elections and that was a very, very big deal. 67.1% of eligible voters came out to vote. In fact, it's just the last two Lok Sabha elections that India has been able to cross the 65% mark. This is a big deal for Indian democracy. But there is also another huge concern. And that's also a concern that the Election Commission has been speaking a lot about. The gap of around 35% eligible voters. The missing eligible voters. At least 35% of eligible voters did not vote. Also, in fact, if you look at what the Election Commission has stated, it's the urban, the youth and the migrants, which are a large part of the 30 crore missing voters. And this is going to be a big challenge in 2024 as well. And this would be a huge number that political parties also would be trying to attract. Urban apathy still continues to be a big challenge, whether it be in the Northern Belt or in the Southern Belt. Bengaluru is one of the uh, cities that is often quoted for its urban apathy, even in assembly elections. Urban apathy being a huge concern across several pockets in India, for that matter. If you look at assembly elections as well, women, of course, are a huge draw. In the last Lok Sabha elections, the BJP scored a massive victory for the second time with a whopping 303 seats, while the Congress managed to win only 52 seats. We must also, and there's so much more to talk about over the course of next few years, uh, next few days, in fact, next few hours, we would also try to look at the different aspects. What is what are What are the challenges in the Hindi heartland, which are the dominant parties in the Hindi heartland? What is it in the Southern Belt? What about the Northeast? How are the women voters being looked at by the different political parties? So many aspects really to cover. Today's importance is something that you have to do. Today's importance is that we will be able to do the election of the country. We will be able to do it at 3am. So we will talk about that. So they have been in power for 10 years. What have they done for Kerala? What have they done for Thiruvanthapuram? This gentleman has been a minister for IT for two and a half years. Has he even brought a single thing? A, a little pin or a chip to our Technopark in Trivandrum? Absolutely zero. The first thing that he has done is a week after being announced as the candidate of the BJP, he has come and announced 10 AI centers. Till then, Kerala was a blank slate for them. Well, I'm being joined by Dr. Narayan Lakshman right now. He's the associate editor for The Hindu. Thank you very much, Dr. Narayan Lakshman, for joining us. Um, let's just start with a very simple thing that has been a huge concern. Many have praised for the kind of voter turnout that India has seen over the last two Lok Sabha elections. But this 30 crore missing voters, how critical can they be for any political party that's looking to gain in this election? Uh, that could turn out to be quite a significant number, especially if there is uh, what you call statistical bunching in terms of you know, groups of people within certain constituencies where large-scale maybe deletion or omission of uh, voter voter accounts has happened. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to speculate on the reasons behind it and how it happened, but it could lead to some uh, undue advantage to certain parties and deprive others of what could legitimately be 
their mandate. Uh, I think a further investigation by the uh, Election Commission and other maybe, you know, court uh, judicial authorities is required before we can really speculate on uh, the specific nature of these uh, omissions, these names missing. But yes, the sheer size of it definitely In fact, Dr. is Dar an extreme cause for concern. Dr. Narayan, um, you know, we may celebrate the fact that we have at least crossed the 65% mark and fairly enough, India is able to do that for the last two Lok Sabha elections. But if you look at it, uh, whether it be for the parliamentary elections, particularly in the assembly elections as well, uh, over the last two years, the assembly elections that have happened, there's been a fall in the percentage of voter turnouts. There's also another aspect of urban apathy that seems to come up when you compare the urban India to the rural India. How do you, what, what's the context? What's the prism, prism to look at all of this? Look, I think that's a very important question. And in part, it could reflect, uh, you know, the fact of, you know, economic progress, ironically, which, you know, is often private sector led and people increasingly depend on the private sector for their um, you know, sustenance for their education, for their healthcare, for their uh, income. When when that happens, especially for the aspiring middle class and the upper middle class and so forth, uh, you you across not just in India but in other countries, if you look at the longest arc of history, you do see uh, apathy, uh, electoral apathy, beginning to set in for these demographic group uh, categories, and um, that is quite unfortunate because it has an immediate impact on the quality of democracy and the quality of civic engagement because it is then when a large number of people exit from demanding certain uh, you know representative uh, uh, you know responsibility and accountability then it is open to capture those who are socially politically and economically powerful then have better chances at capturing the state itself oh. and uh, subverting its uh, resources to their private interests so uh, you're absolutely right to highlight the uh, dropping voter turnout that is a matter for you know great concern um and again as you said about the urban rural divide that i think that mirrors a similar phenomenon where uh yes there is for example you just take as an uh, the case of bangalore uh there is of course a lot of dependence on urban infrastructure authorities for example to deal with the you know consequences of uh, urban pollution flooding uh you know damage that's been caused to those urban water bodies there but at the same time, those who are the economic elite, in a sense, those who benefited from the IT boom, they are able to rely on private sector means whenever these, you know, let's say climate-related disasters strike. Whereas the poor, who are equally subject to these things, do not right. have that option, and they rely upon the state. And therefore, they play a much bigger role in the electoral process. So uh, this is obviously magnified in rural areas where... Uh, you know, large-scale uh, private operations are generally not available across sectors. So this is a lens through which you could definitely analyze uh, yeah. the phenomenon that you just mentioned. Dr. Narayan, another very interesting aspect that, you know, has for at least for the last several elections, if you look at it, at least the parliamentary elections as well as the assembly elections, and for a very long time, in fact, if you look at the history of it also in Tamil Nadu, whether, whether it be in Tamil Nadu, whether it be in Bihar, from free mixes to cycles to computers. There were a lot of efforts, gas cylinders, subsidized gas cylinders to woo the women voters. But, you know, just let's look at the numbers and if we can have the graphics on our screen as well. From two, If you look at 2014 onwards, there has been a consistent increase in the women's vote share. There's 26% of women who have voted compared to 29% of men. 30% in 2019 compared to 32%. And by 2029, at least there's a projection. Uh, it, these are projected figures, will never be absolutely correct. But there's a possibility of women voters crossing the mark of men voters, male voters. If you already look at what the BJP has been talking in its uh, all its rallying points, what, Ra what the Congress has promised, what Rahul Gandhi has promised... Nari Shakti, Nari Nyai, all of this seems to be central theme. But how much of a make or break pattern can the women voters really bring about in elections? And also my question, one more, I'll just ask this together itself. How independent are the voters, are the women voters in India? Um, independent of whom? To be making their own independent choices. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so first, looking at the first part of what you said, I totally agree with you that across the board, and yes, of course, Tamil Nadu led the way in terms of welfare politics. Uh, began in 1967 when the Dravidian movement kicked off, and it very much became a welfare, mass welfare scheme focused state uh, year after year, government after government, whether it was AI, ADMK, or DMK in power. So I think the rest of the nation has also taken its cue from there. And over the years, even a party like the BJP, which you know maybe in an earlier avatar under Atul Bihari Vajpayee prided itself much more on a uh, sort of a growth driven engine for the for the country for the people um has certainly uh, brought welfare measures back front and center and is no longer shy to you know talk about it even you know work it into the propaganda messaging that it has which is to say look we like you said you know we've provided this lpg cylinders we're providing uh, gas connections we are providing all of these things so you know please vote for us so that brings us to the second part of the question which is obviously these uh, in many many Indian households. I'm not. I'm generalizing. Therefore, there are exceptions, of course. But in many uh, of these households, the women are disproportionately the beneficiaries of these products, which come directly as consumption goods to the home. And we're looking at the sphere of microeconomics here and behavioral economics. Uh, women are the ones who are in charge of their families, in charge of nutrition decisions, in charge of uh, you know household management of resources. So they are directly impacted by it and. The fact that they are coming out in stronger numbers and like you said, over the last 10 years tells me that they are actually drawn to this welfareist aspect of the of the BJP-led two governments that we've seen during this time. And uh, that's quite interesting because, you know, it really tells you that the BJP has broadened the kind that's of politics that it that's has. That's a very interesting it, line of thought. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, we, we have all these other... Uh, you know, challenges that we face in terms of gender rights in this country. Obviously, you know, for example, you take the reservation of women to 33%. It's been, uh, you know, widely critiqued for saying, look, you are just nominally putting certain women in power where actually the man who is who used to be there before the reservation is still somehow managing to, managing to control that seat. So, but again, in a country like India, you have to ask yourself, look, some representation of is better than none. And then over time, societal change should start to tip the balance in favor of women being able to exercise independent control, whether in terms of household decisions on how much uh, you know LPG cylinders to use for that family and so forth, to much bigger decisions like who to vote for, who to bring to power, thereby getting the state itself to be responsive to the needs of women as the de facto uh, heads of these families. You know, Narayan Lakshman, I have to ask you this question as well. This, this term of uh, the Modi government has had a lot of schemes, a lot of reforms, as they call, very closely linked to women, whether at least in what they have claimed. UCC, um, if you look at uh, even several other aspects, if I can, um, uh, UCC being one, triple talaq being the other, women's rights, uh, re the reservation in the uh, parliament for the minimum number of mi for the women's quota, all these aspects being there. But then you also have the opposition time and again raising Bilkis Bano. Now, apart from just these schemes or freebies that are offered to women, there seems to be something more that is being debated, something more that is coming out. How much of this is going to influence the Indian voter? Look, uh, Sneha, at the end of the day, every party, whether and, BJP or and Congress, even is CAA going to be very... for that matter. You know, if we saw what happened in... Sorry, just one point. If you, yeah. Even if you look at CAA, what happened at Shaheen Bagh, it was much of women who were at the forefront. So all these, uh, what, what they claim to be as their main pegs, as their main manifesto promises that have come to... that have, that have become a reality... Women, again, are at the forefront of it, whether for the negative or for the positive. How is this going to affect the Indian voter psyche? Look, I think women are definitely uh, yet to be fully convinced. I think as a cohort, if you're looking nationally, it's very difficult to draw conclusions without a full survey or uh, census. But I think, like you said, it's a mixed picture. So one part of the story is that the BJP has rolled in support for women as a major message of its party with whatever view it has about you know uh, ma majority and other politics um, you know without characterizing it for example ucc obviously takes a very strong view on 
getting a level playing ground, playing field for everything from inheritance laws to marriage laws to all of that across religions. Uh, you know, and that has been a major and plank then you of the have BJP the the factor where again a woman may be at the brunt as well. Exactly. So it can go either way. Is my point. You know, it yeah. just goes double whammy. Exactly. Exactly. So that is true of all of these policies, uh, even at the, the triple talaq. While definitely it has been a, seen as a big shot in the arm for women who are, you know, at the receiving end of just being uh, uh, disempowered and deprived of uh, rights to resources when they're divorced or to have a recourse in that situation. There are some who say that this decision should have come, but it could have also come with a more consultative basis within the economy, within the Muslim community. I mean, it's a con controversial subject, and the BJP has definitely taken the higher moral ground, and it's a win for them. Uh, but as you said, I think in every case, there are some women who would not yet be fully convinced by this. There is also going to be regional differences. So in the South, there are very different issues that matter, uh, you know, for, uh, for, for the women's like, rights compared to the North. To bring the, I'm so, glad you brought that divide yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. Let's not assume a single blueprint is possible. But to be, again, both Congress and BJP have tailored their message very carefully in southern states like Kerala and Tamil Nadu. It's quite different if you look at what they're talking about in the North. So I think they are aware of the voter pre preference differences and specifically with regard to women. Um, Narayan Lakshman, one aspect is we may have had the highest representation of women as MPs in Parliament this time. It's still very dismal. All the seats have not been declared till now. All the candidates have not been declared till now. It's too early to say how are the parties faring when it comes to women being fielded as candidates. But, you know, if I have to say, Congress has been talking about Nari Shakti, Nari Nyai, but look at Kerala. At least all the lists are names are out for Kerala. They have just one woman for 20 seats. Now, there's this whole argument of winnability versus allowing them to contest. How do you look at that? Look, I think the allowing them to contest part is, it comes from the fact that nowadays everyone is awake to the fact that you, gender rights is a thing and there is some awareness of that. But even there, you have the divide between urban and rural areas across income classes. The view is very different when you ask, depending on who you ask about this. Unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, in this case, uh, if you're looking at, especially in rural areas where, the, you know, a more traditional caste relations and so on still play a major role, traditional patriarchal relations still play, play a major role, uh, it's going to be difficult for whether Congress or BJP uh, to field a larger number of women candidates. Certainly, even there, there is an understanding that, you know, women have delivered amazing uh, transformational change at the grassroots level, for example, through, uh, you know, microfinance lending. They've actually transformed the rural economy. They have, uh, you know, uh, delivered miraculous outcomes in all regards, even in rural areas. But Indian patriarchy at the end of the day is so strong and uh, it's so sort of deep-rooted in attitudes that there will be a sort of psychic limit that every party hits in terms of how much it can, uh, you know, give women uh, tickets as representing the party's interests. Uh, that is an unfortunate right. fact, in my view. But I also think it's a fact that's slowly changing over time. Uh, we, we just need this process of the economy mm. modernizing, of women being given more economic power, and from that also demonstrating that they can certainly right. handle that and certainly be in the political front seat as well uh, to deliver results on a much greater scale. Narayan Lakshman, it's been absolutely engaging to have this conversation with you. Just one last question. When you look at the 2024 elections, that one thing that comes to your mind? Well, I think, uh, Sneha, this is going this to be a very will put you interesting... This question put spot, I'm sure. Yeah, very interesting election. That's also a referendum on the BJP because, look, we've had two terms and everyone assumed when they won in 2019, the second election, that... Uh, you know, the whole country is for a certain brand of leadership in this nation. They want India to have that sense of pride and stand up on the global stage. You know, for example, the way uh, Minister, uh, Foreign Minister uh, Jay Shankar does so regularly. It's a matter of Indian pride. Now, the question is, after a decade of feeling bolstered, will they still have any sort of sentimental demand that they need from the like of, likes of the, in, of the politics of the BJP? 
Or do they feel that, look, we have established a certain track record for 10 years. India has made a lot of progress. Let's give someone else a try. And at the back of everyone's mind is also the fact that right. you don't want a democracy to have no opposition party. Even a party that's delivering good Absolutely. results, like the BJP has on the economic front, you need no, those, to those have are, checks and balances. You have to look at... Those are very valid points, perform. Mr. Nara, and I'm being told you're totally out of time. My point stands, which is... Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Nara and Lakshman, for joining us with, the, with those very, very insightful thoughts. Thank you. Time for a short break.